Hello everyone, it's Benny, and in this video, we're going to be talking about parallax displacement mapping. And that's a technique that can take just a couple of polygons and make them look like they're composed of millions and millions of polygons. Take these planes, for instance. There are only two polygons, but they look like they're composed of just a huge, huge number of polygons because, well, because of the parallax displacement effect. And yeah, so in this particular video, we're going to be talking about how this technique works. What's the idea behind it? How is this actually doing anything? And yeah, how it works. So let's go ahead, let's dive in, and let's get started. So before we talk about parallax displacement mapping, Let's talk about regular displacement mapping for a moment, because that's the basis of parallax displacement mapping. Now here's what'll happen in regular displacement mapping. You'll have some polygon, in this case I'm using a plane that we're looking at edge on, but this can be anything you want. And you also have the displacement map itself, which is some grayscale texture that might look something like this for bricks, for instance. And the idea is, you'll take the plane and you'll tessellate it. You'll just chop it up until you have approximately one polygon per pixel. At least that's the ideal. Sometimes it's a little bit off from that, but ideally you have one polygon per pixel. And what you do then is you'll read from this placement mapping and offset all those vertices for those really tiny polygons based on the value stored in the map. So for example, white would be maximum up, and black would be maximum down, offset. And after you do the offset, you might have something that looks a little bit like this. And of course the original plane would be gone now, because you've offset all the vertices. And there, so it's just a nice easy way of generating geometry based on this height map, dynamically, on the fly. And you can get some really really high quality geometry by doing this. The problem is we almost never use displacement mapping in real time, especially not at this fine-grained scale that films and such like to do. And here's why. The first issue is the polygon count. You can take one polygon in, and after displacement mapping you can spit out well over a million polygons just from all the tessellation to get one polygon per pixel. And if you already have a scene with millions and millions of polygons, having a process that spits out millions and millions more, generally not desirable. Now with hardware tessellation and such, the problem has been not as bad as it was in the past, but it's still not ideal. However, the real thing that kills displacement mapping outright for real-time applications is the way GPU rasterization works. So let's say this is your screen. You got a really tiny low resolution screen for some reason. <laughs> it looks a little bit like this. And you're trying to render some displacement mapped geometry. Now, like I said, in displacement mapping, you'll chop up the polygon so there's really, really tiny polygons. Ideally, one polygon per pixel. So you have your tiny polygon might look something like this. It's just a tiny part of a pixel. Now, you might think the GPU is just going to fill in that one pixel where that polygon is, do all the shading calculations, and be done with it. But that's not what happens. What it'll actually do is it'll shade the 2x2 two two region around it, even though the polygon isn't touching these other three pixels. It'll calculate full-on shading calculations and whatnot for them anyways. And the reason for this is it makes it really easy for the GPU to calculate texture derivatives. So you can get nice, accurate, sam properly sampled textures with perspective correction and all that jazz without having to go through a lot of pain that you might otherwise have to. I'm not going to go too in-depth on that later. You, maybe I'll make a video on this technique, some the way this works sometimes, more in-depth, but the idea is it'll rasterize at the smallest thing the GPU can draw is a 2x2 two two square of pixels. It does not draw individual pixels because otherwise that will make 
texture derivatives and whatnot hard to calculate. So even when you have these tiny polygons that only take up a fraction of a single pixel, it'll draw the pixels all around it. And then after it's gone through all those four pixels, done all the complicated shading calculations that are involved, it'll finally discard all of them, all the three pixels that were necessary, and you end up with the final correct pixel. Now the good news about this is it works. You do get proper looking geometry like this. The bad news is you can potentially do six completely unnecessary shading calculations per pixel. And when you're shading millions and millions of pixels, this is a huge problem. Especially since shading is actually, in general, not always, but in general, the most complex calculation in, in real-time applications. It's the most computationally expensive part of, of the whole thing. So making that six times more expensive, generally not an option. So that, for the most part, kills displacement mapping outright as an option for real-time for real-time rendering. Now there have been some advances in recent times to try and alleviate this two by two square conundrum for really tiny polygons, but G at least as of right now, GPUs aren't there yet. This is still a big problem, and well, that just means we can't do a lot of displacement mapping. And that's why parallax displacement mapping was invented. The idea is we want this nice, good-looking displacement mapping, but without all the drawbacks, without having to create these tiny polygons that'll screw up the GPU rasterization scheme and spit out millions and millions of polygons into our scenes that already have millions and millions of polygons. So we have our plane, and we want to make this plane look like this, look like the displaced geometry. Now, of course, we can't actually displace the geometry, but we can do something else. Now, we know what the geometry should look like. That's stored in the displacement map. We know what all the offsets and everything should be. We also know what direction we're looking at that plane. So, you know, the camera might be off in this direction somewhere. So we know that. So here's the idea. If we're just drawing this plane normally, we'll be reading the texture and the normal and whatnot at point A. That'll be what's drawn, well, yeah, if we're just drawing it normally. But if the viewing direction is this right here, it should actually be point B if we had all the displaced geometry there. So what if we offset the texture coordinates so that they're at the proper value, so that well, so they're pointing to the proper texture location, and proper, um, yeah, at the proper texture location, proper normal location, and whatnot, based on the viewing direction, and what the displacement map says the displacement should be. And that's the idea of parallax displacement mapping. You're creating the displacement map by offsetting the texture coordinates, and. Yeah, so you're creating some texture offset, by this much in this case, and you're reading the texture and the normal and everything from this point instead. And that'll make it look like there's a sort of geometry there because of, well, because of the way you're reading the texture coordinates. And here's how this works. So, at every point, you'll be able to read the height. That's, well, the height value. And what you can do is you can scale the viewing direction by that height amount. Now, as you see, that doesn't quite reach the correct point. It's still a little bit off. So, yeah. In case you didn't pick up on it already based on the texture coordinate offset not actually generating geometry, yeah, this is an approximation. This is a hack. This <laughs> so, this isn't going to be exact, but it's going to look roughly correct. So yeah, we're making the length of this the height that we've read at the value. And as long as point B is roughly the same height as point A, this will get a point that's very, very close to what point B should be. So in this case, it reads that point right there. As you see, not exactly what it sh the actual, well, you know, actual values should be, but close enough to fool the eye in most cases. So, 
we get that value, that's a texture coordinate offset. And we just add that to our texture coordinates, and we're on our merry way. And honestly, that's it. There's really isn't a math heavy or technical heavy, well, technique. <laughs> it's really just understanding the concept that you're simulating the, the geometry based on the value in the height map. And again, the way you do that is you read the value from the height map, you multiply, the, or well, I should say, you set the length of the view direction to that height, and then that'll give you the texture coordinate offset. So, yeah. Now there is one slight problem with this. What if the plane is rotated? And in that case, the viewing direction is still pointing off this way somewhere. <laughs> so it's pointing like into the plane, and y you know, that's not right anymore. The, the viewing direction needs to be relative to the plane. So the way you fix that is pretty simple. You just take the viewing direction and rotate it, well, into the same orientation as the plane. And the way you do that is by having a normal and a tangent and constructing a TBN matrix. And this is the same technique that you do in normal mapping, exactly the same. So, since I've already talked about that, I'm not going to talk more about it here. If you want to know more about how cr constructing the TBN matrix that rotates the viewing thing into position works, look at my video on the mathematics of normal mapping. I talk all about tangents and, well, how that works there. And yeah. So in conclusion, let's look at some of the pros and cons of this technique. This is, all in all, a pretty good approximation of displacement mapping. It's not perfect, but even taking into account its shortcomings, it's still pretty good. Another really good thing about it is it's compatible and a good complement to other types of geometric mapping, like normal mapping or specular mapping. So if you have techniques like those that are also designed to sort of make it look like there's extra geometry, this can really start to look convincing, like there actually is some real 3D polygons modeled in there, even though there actually aren't. And as a result of that, this, this can also be a pretty good substitute for additional geometry, especially in cases where you need really, really tiny polygons, which would otherwise not work out very well just because of the way GPU rasterization is. So yeah, all in all, there's a lot of good things with the technique. This technique is not without its faults, however. For one, this does not handle sharp changes in ge geometry well, or I guess I should have written, it doesn't handle sharp changes in the displacement map well. If you have a displacement map that's, for the most part, completely flat, and then all of a sudden you have that one extreme white spike in there, yeah, that's going to look a little bit weird. Because keep in mind, the actual value you read in parallax displacement mapping is slightly offset from the actual value, so it's possible you could miss a spike completely in some cases and hit it dead on in some completely different place, and yeah, it can start to look a little bit weird. <laughs> so, as long as you have s relatively smooth changes, then it tends to work okay. And fortunately, most displacement maps are like that, so that's usually not a big deal, but it's worth being aware of. Another thing is this breaks down at shallow viewing angles. So, if, obviously, if you're looking at the plane edge-on, you're still going to see a plane. It's not actually creating the geometry, so yeah. And another issue with this is the texture offsets can actually start getting rather extreme at shallow viewing angles, and that makes... And you know how it's usually a little bit offset from where it's supposed to be? Well, when you're at a shallow viewing angle, it can be just in a completely different place in the texture from where it's supposed to be. And that can make the texture just look like a big, noisy blob. Now, there's some things you can do to help that, to stop it from breaking down as much, but ultimately it does break down if you get your viewing angle shallow enough. And finally, this does add a very small per-polygon overhead, even for polygons that don't have displacement mapping. So, and it works just like normal mapping. There's still that just slight overhead from 
either having a default displacement map or from switching to displacement map on and displacement map off based on which ones do and don't use it. So yeah, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, that's entirely irrelevant. But if you have some place where, you know, you're just re-rendering things over and over, like in forward rendering or something, it's worth being aware of. Because in cases like that, there is the off chance that, that this adds up and creates a performance problem. But again, in most cases, it's not relevant. It's just one of those things that's worth being aware of for that oddball case where it is relevant. So yeah. And really, that's Parallax Displacement Map. So, thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned. And I'll see you in the next video, where we're going to be talking about a practical implementation of Parallax Displacement Mapping. I'm going to be taking an actual 3D game engine that doesn't have Parallax Displacement Mapping and showing you how you can add it in including some of the challenges that go along with that, and some of the challenges to overcome some of these issues, like it breaking down at shallow viewing angles. And yeah, so thank you, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and see you then.